We are joined by Judo Crazy's Un Yo. How you doing, sir? Hi, hi. How are you? It's been a while since we last spoke. It, it certainly has. It certainly has. Uh, how are things going? Uh, pretty good. I mean, um, over here in Malaysia, where I'm based, I'm uh, pretty much focused on, you know, running my judo club and building up my judo club. But, uh, yeah, you know, the I think the I can't remember when was the last time we spoke, but back then there wasn't a lot of uh, IGF tournaments going on because of COVID. Right. And now the, the IGF circuit is back in full swing and uh, it's pretty exciting, you know, to watch all these top players get back into, into competition. For sure. And do you mind just telling us a little bit about your, your website and, and all the great content you produce? I just joined your, your Patreon uh, Patreon group, so uh, I'm really excited to dive into all that content. But tell us a little bit about Judo Crazy. Okay. Well, you know, Judo Crazy itself uh, consists of a few different um, platforms. Uh, it's I guess Judo Crazy is, is a brand. And I have a, a Facebook page, of course. And then I have a Patreon page where I post some exclusive content. And I also have a website, which is judocrazy.com, which uh, has not been active for a few months. You know, I'm, I'm going to restart it and restructure it a little bit and think about how all these things will fit together. You know, I, I've also got a Judo Crazy Instagram. So there's Instagram, there's Facebook, there's the Patreon site, and then there's the website. And I'm still trying to, you know, get my head around how all these things will fit with each other. You know, what will go on to the social media, what will go on to the Patreon, what will go on to the website, and, and so on. So I don't have a, a concrete solution yet, but I'm, I'm trying to think about how each will play a role. But but the, the website is, is, is basically free content. Everything there is. There's no paywall. There's nothing uh, of the sort. Whereas Patreon... A lot of the content is free, but there's some exclusive content that I, I that that's for patrons only. So so that you know so that's what it is basically. And of course, the Facebook and Instagram are mostly small clips, and and those are free. You know, so right. so I guess Judo Crazy is a brand uh, that represents you know you know uh, content, interesting content for people who are interested in IJF type of judo. You know. Right. Uh, IGF Nation Judo. Right. And, and you also run a website for, for your dojo where you have a blog. Can you tell us about that? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm based here in Malaysia and I have a base in Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I run a, a judo club. I'm a judo coach. I'm, I, I, I was a former international competitor and now I'm a coach and I run a, a, a judo club called KL Judo Center. KL standing for Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so Kuala Lumpur Judo Center, and I have a, a website, kljudo.com, where uh, I post videos, you know, of instructionals, highlights of uh, the training that we do and all that. And it's very much a local thing. It's not meant for international, but, you know, where there could be uh, uh, some sort of integration between what I'm doing at KL Judo and Judo Crazy is that uh, again, I, I don't have a concrete solution, but you know, I, I teach judo and I do instructional videos. I'm trying to see also how I could like uh, create interesting instructional content around interesting and innovative techniques mm. and somehow tie that in with judo crazy, you know, which which is something thus far I've not done. You know, judo crazy is, is just, just about news and videos and news about IJF related stuff. It's it's not got any instructional video elements or demonstrations of techniques, but I think that's something that uh could be interesting. Like, you know, if you watch an IJF event and you see an interesting new choke or an interesting entry into an arm lock or an interesting sankaku or some innovative new throw, a new way of doing uh Seonage, for example. And you want to talk about it. I mean, you could show clips of it, but sometimes to fully explain what's going on, you need to demonstrate it. You know, and it's it's something I do for my students at KL Judo, but I'm not yet, you know, integrated into Judo Crazy in any way. But I, I might do in the future. You know, 
Right. I, I, I mention it because obviously you've got a blog there and you shared some some interesting uh, entries uh, that uh, that you recently published. And I guess we'll get into those topics a, a bit later on because I, I find I find them, you know, as far as the quote unquote judo ecosystem or combat sports ecosystem obviously you're strictly about judo and you don't want to talk about these other sports i get <laughs> that all, all good no worries of course but i think there's a real need for content in terms of judo literacy you mm. know for for recreationalists and fans like myself and i found you, your article really interesting your articles pardon me your blogs two two of them in regards to practical uh applications for beginners and advanced uh for practitioners competitors etc so you know i think there is a need for that sort of content i know that uh people on this side of the globe i'm i'm located in ottawa ontario canada i know that uh people out here in the grappling community outside of the judo community want to learn judo in fact you know what i mean they, they are learning they're trying to explore throwing i'm talking about grapplers who are primarily in, in other grappling styles that maybe don't emphasize much of the tachiwaza. So people are interested, you know, in learning. And I think that, it, you know, enabling that judo literacy at, at the recreational level uh, with, with this sort of content is, is fascinating. So thank you for sharing those blogs. We'll get into them. But first and foremost, we want to talk about Klimkite de Gucci at the Tel Aviv Grand Slam 2023. But before we get into their, you know, the tournament matches and their their matches in the finals, which I'm very curious to hear your your assessment of of, of all of that, I want you to yeah. tell us uh, tell us about both of these competitors, starting with Klim Kite. What's her strength as a competitor? How how would you describe her strength as as a as a competitor in judo? Okay, well, Jessica Klim Kite. Um... And uh, Krista De Gucci, their their backgrounds, their respective backgrounds, and the context of their rivalry is is is, is super interesting. It's super interesting. Um, okay, so Clean Kate first, uh, I guess, uh, since you asked uh, uh, about about her first, let's see. I mean, Jessica Clean Kate, her 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 strength, uh, of course, is her uh, uh her her drop techniques, right? The drop se oinage. And the drop sode, which are very similar. Uh, the gripping is a little bit different. The sode involves, you know, double sleeve usually. She usually does it from double sleeve. And then the drop seonagi is a drop morote seonagi. And the way she enters into both and the way she executes both are very similar. They, they are almost interchangeable. The gripping is a little bit different. But, you know, it's, it's her bread and butter. It's her main technique. She does do one or two other techniques, but it's re she's really mainly a, a drop a player and in the early years I, I remember um even Neil Adams you know uh, commenting that uh that 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 she should expand her range that 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 it's it's somewhat limited you know just doing drop techniques and all that but he is, she has shown uh over the years that you know if you're so good at that technique maybe maybe it's enough you know and and she has and she has developed an almost unstoppable drop Morote Sionagi, drop Sode Surikomikoshi. People can't stop it, you know. People know it's coming. They know that's what she does. They know what to expect, but they can't stop it. And 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 it still works at the highest level, you know. And and even if it doesn't score, she can, you know, she attacks so much and so often that the opponents get penalties, you know. And and so it's just, I think her strength is. The, the 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 power and the dynamism of her drop techniques and her relentless drive you know she's always attacking always attacking non-stop you know and um almost in a tactical way you know i mean it's like if i can't, if i can't throw you i'm gonna get you uh you know get you to incur penalties mm -hmm. you know and, and 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 so it's just non-stop attacks and you know really very very effective uh you know drop techniques and also in in very recent years, she's also developed uh some pretty good newaza ground groundwork. Uh, she didn't used to do a whole lot of newaza. You know, in the early years, she was mainly a tachiwaza player with very little newaza. But uh, in in recent years, she's developed 
a nice sankaku. She has a huizinga role. I, that's a technique made famous by Mark Huizinga. And 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 uh and she she's had quite a bit of success with that you know, at the Olympics and 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 you know she she actually used Newaza, which surprised quite a lot of people because mm. most people think of her as a as a as a Tachi Waza player. But yeah, you know, it'll be her really her uh her powerful drop techniques. That that's uh that's her strength. Uh, if I can ask a follow-up, if you don't mind, in terms of uh you know, you're you're a big historian of, of the sport, of course. Is there anyone she reminds you of from back in the day? And I apologize if I'm putting you on the spot here. I should have probably, uh, you know, drafted this question in advance. But, but <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious. Is there anyone that you would compare her to uh, in terms of her fighting style and, and so on? Um. Well, you know, there are, there are uh, other drop seal nagi specialists over the years, right? But uh, I would say there are not that many who are so incredibly uh, focused on the drop technique. Mm -hmm. Like people think of Tadahiro Nomura as a great Morote seal nagi player, and he was. But, you know, if you watch his uh, uh, his career, he had actually many techniques, you know. He he, he did Tayatoshi, he even did Uchimata, he, you know, he was capable of doing uranage. Uh, he, he even did uh, in, in one of the competitions a kind of kataguruma side takedown and 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 so on. And he's got ipon seonage as well. So he, he had a wider range of techniques. He's principally a drop morate seonage player, but wasn't as exclusively drop seonage as as uh, Tim K. You know, uh, I can't really think of that many players. Who was so, so very, very, very focused on uh, a, a particular technique? Mm. Uh, I mean, there was a, a there was a, a Polish player who actually, int interestingly, right now I think is a coach in Canada, Pavlovsky, who who was a drop seonagi specialist. You no, know? but but I, I can't really think of anybody who was so almost exclusively focused on drop seonagi and 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 drop sode as her now let's speak about the gucci what would you say her strengths are as, as a competitor paint that picture for us please okay well the gucci has a, a, a super interesting history uh uh do, do you know do you know much about uh krista the gucci's background not that much to be honest i, I know obviously she was competing for for Japan, and I've been following right. her uh, along the way, particularly when she jumped over. And, and she's Canadian, of course. She's, she's Japanese Canadian. So, uh, but educate us on, on her, please. Okay, so so what was interesting about the Gucci? I think the real interesting thing is that when, when she was she was a, a young player, a junior player, she showed really a lot of potential. And then, uh, and then you know after. Uh, October 2014, her career stalled for about three years. You know, the, from, from October 2014 onward uh, until October 2017, that's a period of three years when she was in Japan. She didn't represent Japan in any IGF competition. She didn't do any international competitions for three years. I, I don't know the exact circumstances of why that was, but it was during that period when uh, Kaori Matsumoto, who's a great Japanese uh, Olympic champion and, and 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 I think double world champion, uh, she has, I think, two world titles and, and an Olympic champion. It was during the reign of Kaori Matsumoto. So, uh, so basically, when you have such a dominant player like Kaori Matsumoto, nobody else had a chance. And, and so, um, Kristen Deguchi had no international fights from October 2014 to October 2017 and and during those three period uh, those, those three years people thought well her career is over I mean you know she, 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 she's not fighting but then um, in October 2017 she emerged as a competitor for Canada right because her father is Canadian and she got an opportunity to represent Canada uh, instead of Japan. And uh, in her first two uh, Grand Slams, af after she uh, switched 
countries. Uh, she failed in she she lost in the first her first match. Her first uh her, her debut as a Canadian fighter was at the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam, and she lost in, in, in the first match. Then she went to the Tokyo Grand Slam and lost in the first match as well. So it looked like her, you know, her her comeback, you know, was was over even before it started. But then something interesting happened. Then she, after that, she won the Paris Grand Slam. She won the Paris Grand Slam, beating uh, Sukasa Yoshida, the 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 Japanese champion who, uh, who replaced Kaori Matsumoto. So she won that. Then she won the Pan American Championships. Then she won the Ho Hot. Uh, Grand Prix, the Zagreb Grand Prix, uh, you know, so so she started winning and uh, representing Canada in the 2019 World Championships, which was held in Tokyo, she beat Yoshida, the top Japanese in her home country, on home, home ground in Japan, and won the world title in 2019. So I think that was a a sweet victory for her, you know, because she she wasn't able to represent Japan from you know uh, 2014 to 2017, and now you know representing Canada, she beats the the Japanese champion in Tokyo and and wins a world title, right? Right. So she wins the world title, and she's this new world champion, this great find for Canada, and you know you had Jessica Klimkit also doing well internationally. And for a while, if you look at the IGF rankings, it would be Klimkate number one and the Gucci number two, or the Gucci number one and Klimkate number two. They were neck and neck because both of them were doing well internationally. But when they fought each other in IGF events or international events, the Gucci always won. And you know, for six consecutive international uh, fights, mostly IGF events, but I think there's one Pan American Championships in there. But six in a row, Krista Deguchi won. Every single time they fought in those six competitions, Krista Deguchi won every single time. So going into the Tokyo Olympics, most people, including myself, assume it's going to be Deguchi that's going to be picked. You know, she's a world champion. She always beats Klim K, you know, but then something unusual happened. COVID happened. You know, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Canada was thinking of, uh, because they had difficulty choosing between the two, right? Both had qualified for the Olympics. Who do you choose? So they were going to have a runoff with three fights, three matches, and whoever wins best of three would would go to, uh, to Tokyo. But COVID happened and they couldn't hold that special championships. So they decided, okay, the 2021 World Championships will decide who gets to go. And in the 2021 World Championships, uh, 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 Kate became world champion. So she got to go to the, uh, she got to go to the Olympics and she won a bronze there. And, and, it, and uh, so, you know, suddenly she's a world champion and a bronze medalist and the Gucci is a world champion but with no uh Olympic bronze. Mm. So suddenly Klim Kate shot above the Gucci and the Gucci wasn't doing well in, in, in the IGF circuit for a while. But recently she rebounded. Okay, she won the uh Baku Grand Slam. Yeah, she won gold in the Baku Grand Slam in the Jerusalem uh World Master. She she won gold again. So she rebounded. So everybody was really excited about this Tel Aviv uh, Grand Slam because the Gucci was in uh, Pool A and I think Klim Kate was in Pool C, which means they could have they could meet in the final if they beat everybody else. And indeed, they did meet in the final, and uh, that was their seventh encounter. And uh, everybody knows that you know in the in the past six encounters, the Gucci won. You know, uh, would Klim Kate finally make a breakthrough? Well, it turns out she did, and and she beat the Gucci. So, uh, first time after seven, you know, seven. Uh, she I guess seventh time lucky. Well, you can't call it luck. She she I mean she 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 won it. Well, you know, she won it in Golden Score. She threw the Gucci, but uh, so it, it yeah, was, it, it, yeah, it was definitely a war. I'm I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt there. It was it was I, I appreciate all this 
uh, information you're, you're sharing with us here. Uh, I'm curious to know, well, I guess this is a two-part question. How common mm. is it having two top players, uh, you know, in the same division competing for, for that spot? Like, is, is there, can you kind of give us a quick kind of historical, mm, looking sure. back at histories, are there similar storylines? Uh, nothing as as um, I think dramatic as this one, <laughs> no, no, but but yeah, you definitely do have, uh, especially in Japan, right? In Japan, because they've got s- such depth of talent, usually the number one and two are both world level. You know, uh, usually one, two, three, and four are world, world level, but one and two are absolutely top champions. You know, like for example, in the seventy three division, well, there was Ono. And then and then he's retired now. I say was because he but there was Ono and there was there was Hashimoto and both of them were world champions, right? Absolutely world world top world level players, right? At uh 66, you've got Abe and Maruyama, both are world champions, right? At 60 kilos, you've got Takato, who's a you know Olympic and world champion, and you've got Nagayama, who's not a, a, a world champion, but really up there in terms of uh, uh, uh you know capabilities so you've got but but also in the women's division i mean you look at uh hifumi abe's sister uh uta abe at 52 she's a world and olympic champion but you know you've got uh shishimi ai who's uh, uh i think she's a double world champion you know in the same category so in japan you see that a lot mm-hmm. uh, in japan you see a lot of uh 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 top, absolutely top champions in the same weight category. But you've seen it also in in, in Germany, you've seen it in, in the Netherlands, you see it uh, in England, you, you, you do see it in other countries as well. Uh, not as much as in Japan, but 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 you do see it. And, and the interesting thing is that when it does happen, uh, it usually does bring out the best in, in th- those two players because, you know, they've really got to beat their domestic rival. They've yeah. really got to do it, you know, and uh, 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 either that or they've got to change weight categories. Mm. I mean, if you look at Kosovo's, uh, Kosovo has three Olympic champions, but two of them, uh, Kalmendi and Krasniki, used to be in the same weight class. They were both 52. And uh, what happened was uh, uh, Krasniki moved down. She moved down to 48. And Kalmendi stayed at 52. Now, Krasniki has moved back up to, to, to 52. But but yeah, for a while, you know, those two were in the same way category and they used to fight each other. And, and it was a very similar situation where Kalmendi would win all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and Krasniki would be like uh, the, uh, the analogy of, of Clint Cage. He would lose all the time uh, to, to, to Kalmendi. But he, eventually, uh, Krasniki became Olympic champion in her own right, you know. And um, but yeah, so to answer your question, it does happen uh, mostly in Japan, right. but you do see it happen in, in other countries as well. Now, it's interesting you mentioned the word drama, right? It's or dramatic. It's very dramatic. And, uh, you know, for, for me, I was thinking about this for, for quite some time. I'm like, man, why can't we have a Netflix documentary? <laughs> you know what I mean? Exploring these sorts of uh, incredible uh rivalries which i think as as a fan of, of this sport judo i think values um is is good for the sport in general of course and uh, as you mentioned you know it brings out the best of both competitors and i kind of want to explore that with a, a, a follow up again in terms of klim uh Kate, pardon me you know how does she lose? How, what? How do people beat her? What? What do they look for to exploit in in her? In in, in terms of you know, how, how does she generally lose? Well, well, how, I, how, I guess what I'm asking is, what's her? I don't want. What's her weakness? Well, what do people look for uh, when, when they? Well, well in the past, when 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 she's lost, she she has lost because of penalties. She has lost because of penalties, right? It's uh uh you know, but she's a really solid, solid fighter, right? I mean, she she's she's very good at uh, uh tachiwaza, you know, the her drop techniques are, are superb. And she's gotten really strong in Awaza as well. 
So, you know, uh, when the, you know, but but people have beaten her uh, on 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 penalties. So she 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 misplayed uh, or mis miscalculated certain uh, uh, you know tactical plays before where she, you know, she 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 lost on penalties. Uh, got got Hansuko Market because of, of of you know penalties and and so, uh, I don't know if you want to describe that as a weakness, but but she has been de- been been defeated through penalties. Right. Yeah. No. I I struggled with the word weakness. I don't. You know. What I mean. I I don't want to to mention, but just in terms of s- simple terms, I just say weakness. But I'm saying, you know, everyone has something. I would imagine as a competitor that that possibly. Could be exploited uh, on, on competition during. Competition. I, I would say that she 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 doesn't have. If you want to talk about like you know there are certain players who are okay. He's he's not good in Nawaza. You know right. his weakness is Nawaza or his stamina. You know he runs out of uh, steam after four minutes or whatever. I don't see that kind of very obvious weaknesses that anybody can exploit. I mean she's she's very good in Tachiwaza, very good in Nawaza, and it's it's not like she's. Uh, uh, not a tactically aware player. She's she's also very tactical. But I have noticed that she has lost, uh, or you know, on penalties. But 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 when she fought the Gucci in Tel Aviv, it was quite a tactical match. I mean, she did fight the Gucci quite tactically, and it was actually quite obvious that the Gucci was more going for the throw, mm. and and she nearly threw. Well, she did knock. Uh, 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 Klimkate down a few times, you know, she came in with, with some good attacks and knocked her down, no score. But the Gucci was, was going for the throw, and Klimkate was fighting more tactically, more strategically, uh, because she's lost so many times to the Gucci before. Maybe she had a more tactical approach, uh, right. to, to, to fight. but in the end, she threw, she threw the Gucci, she won by a throw, but she was fighting very tactically, a lot of gripping, controlling. The Gucci's power hand. It was very tactical fight. What would you say in terms of that same question I asked for for the Gucci? But before we dive into the, their their matches, what would you say the Gucci? How does the Gucci lose? Well, what happens? Is it the same sort of scenario? You know, uh, again, I I would say that uh, you know with with certain players and even certain great champions, uh, sometimes they have. Uh, some aspect of their play which is a little bit lacking like uh, maybe they're not so tactically aware or maybe they're not so good in Nawaza or you know or they're not so uh, fit you know that, that does happen I, I mean especially some of those power players from Azerbaijan and, and, and Georgia sometimes they run out of steam after four minutes they run out because they're so powerful and they, they, they just give it all they've got in regular time and then you go into golden score and they run out of steam. And so that's their, their weakness. And you've seen certain players from Japan who are not so tactically aware. You know, they they, they can throw big, but they they, they, they they can't really play the Shido game and things like that, right? So there are weaknesses. But the Gucci, like Lim Kate, is a very solid Tachiwaza player. She's a very solid Nawaza player as well. She's good in Nawaza as well. So, uh, you know, so I, I think... Uh, uh, she doesn't have any weaknesses in, in, in that obvious weaknesses in that regard. If anything, maybe I would say she's not so obvious a tactical player. She she's going for the throw. So um, but that's not so surprising because she, she comes from Japan and, and most of uh I mean you know she's Canadian, but I think she 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 grew up in Japan and her training is in Japan. Mm-hmm. And and there yeah, the the ethos is to go for for throws right to go for the ipon, and and to throw so you could see that in the in in the Tel Aviv final as well she was going for the kill she was going for the throw she was trying to throw Klim Kate while Klim Kate was fighting more tactically, and so uh, perhaps um, she's not so much of a tactical fighter, uh, and uh, and maybe I would say Klim Kate is a little bit more tactically aware. Uh, or more tactically savvy than than uh, than the Gucci, and I think going forward, if you see them fight again, I think you will see the same thing. You'll see Clean Kate approach the match in a more tactical manner. Mm. Who's the better fighter? 
who's the better competitor? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot here. You don't have to yeah. answer. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the answer to that question will be, you know, who who prevails, right? Because results, uh, you know, uh, is, is what counts, right? So we'll see at the end of this Olympic cycle who gets chosen for uh, the Paris Olympics. Right now, it's up in the air. It looks like it looks like Tim Kate has slight advantage, but you know, um, both of them are world beaters. They 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 they're, they're at, absolutely at the top of the game. They can beat the best in the world, but it's six to one in favor of the Gucci in terms of their matchups. Right. So it'll be interesting. I mean, let's say both of them qualify for the Olympics, which I think would be the case. How will Canada Canada choose, right? Will they have that special runoff and have them fight three matches and see who wins the best of three? Or will they look at who has the highest position in the, the last World Championships before the Olympics? I'm not sure. It, it, it depends how, how they choose to do it. But I guess the better fighter will be the one who makes it, you know. You just have to go by results. But... Um, but but you know basically the Gucci is 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 a more uh it ha, has more versatility in terms of her throws. She has more throws, a wider range of throws, more versatility. Uh, and Clean Kate is very focused on drop Seonagi and drop Sode. You know, so that that's the difference uh between their approaches. And I would say Clean Kate is more tactically savvy, more willing to play the tactical game. Uh, I think that's not really the approach, the inclination of somebody like the Gucci to fight tactically. She, she's, she's more Japanese in that sense. She wants to go for the throw. Do you think uh, the, the Gucci is going to have to maybe explore a, a d different approach uh, in regards to to dealing with uh, with Jessica? I, I think so. I think I think for sure. Well, you know, what well, the Gucci has shown that she can beat the best in the world, right? She can beat the rest of the, the best. She has shown that she 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 can do that. But now, after Tel Aviv, we know that Team Kate can beat her. Right. We know it's possible, right? Before that, it was Team Kate never beat the Gucci, but now we know Team Kate can do that. And I'm sure she and her coach will be watching the video over and over again to see, right? How did how did Jessica Kinkit spoil her grip and you know fought, fight tactically and 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 without in the end and I'm sure she'll be studying that tape and I'm sure she will be adjusting her approach at least with regards to fighting Kinkit she might not necessarily have to change her approach when fighting other players because her approach is working right she's she's beating other top players from the world but in fighting Kinkit she may have to adjust. Uh, accordingly, to in in order to beat, you know, Klim K, who has found a formula, found a way to beat the Gucci. Yeah, and and just before our our interview here, I went back to to watch the match, uh, and and particularly the walkout as they were making their way over. And if you go back and you look at Klim K, man, she looks so intense when she's walking out there, bro. She like. Like the the raw intensity there, it was just like this undercurrent of just, you know, she you know she was mentally prepared for war. It's it's one of those things, and you know I'm I'm just a fan. I'm I'm watching this stuff. I watch other combat sports, whatever. But when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is an in, this is an incredible moment, and and I I love these sorts of things and these competitive rivalries. But, sir, thank you very much for setting all that up. Now we're going to dive right into uh, each match um, and then the, the, their final match. So we'll, we'll okay. let you take it away from here, please. Okay, well, let's look at uh, Krista de Gucci's matches first, right? So she fought the the, the Dutch uh, girl, Van de Meeberg. And, you know, she used, uh, uh, she scored twice. One was with a, what we call a sticky foot kosoto. Where it's not a sweep, but you know she she kind of hooks the 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 foot and takes her down, and then she she followed that up with, I guess you could call it a say oi otoshi, where she steps wide and then she blocks the foot and then she drops down, 
and pulls the girls down, you know. So so she, that's how she got past her first match. Her second match against Pereira of Brazil, she used uh, one of her uh, popular techniques, uh, her favorite techniques, Osotogari. That is a big Osoto. That's something she's known for. Uh, she's good at that. And then, interestingly, the next two matches, she won by Hansuko Maki, right? Where her opponent, her opponents did uh, illegal techniques mm. that, you know, that, that earned them the Hansuko Maki. So Stark from Germany uh, did a movement where it's, it's, it's called attacking the supporting leg. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but um, I, in I judo, am, right, yeah, so yeah. I, I am actually, you've written an article about, about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, please, yeah. bring it it's down. Illegal in judo, but basically, when an opponent um, attacks you with a front attack, attack to the front, mm. and you're behind the opponent, you can't attack their supporting leg from the inside. You know, you're standing behind them, you cannot go in between their legs and attack their supporting leg. If you do that, it's a Hansuku market penalty because if the legs get entangled and they fall the wrong way, that your opponent's knee might break. You right. know, you could seriously injure your opponent when you when when you do that. And so it's illegal in judo. And and I I'm hundred percent sure the German girl didn't intend to do it. it I was. He, Exactly. I was just going to ask you because I went back and I looked at the clip and I'm like, I, you know, obviously, you know, you, you, there's there's a forward momentum or, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's not, it didn't look intentional. It's not intentional. But, but, you know, in judo, when you, when you uh, make an infringement, a penalty, it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or not. If you touch the leg, right, you might have accidentally touched the leg, but it's still a penalty, right? So in this case, she she clearly didn't intend to attack the supporting leg, but she, but her leg went in there, from behind, in between, and 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 so it it, it was a Hansuku Maki penalty, <clears throat> so she got disqualified. Then that brought Diguchi up against Daria Bilodit, right? The mm -hmm. famous Daria Bilodit, who's moved up from forty eight to fifty seven, and um, and I don't know. Who, what caused Below Date to do this, but she did a, a, an illegal arm lock. It was a waki katami kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, arm lock from a standing position, and, and that, that's illegal. So, you know, so she 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 won by two Hansuku Makis, and that took her into the final, right? About so, that last one with Beloaded, I, I I don't know. I I, I don't want to say that one was not in like it, it, to me. It looked pretty. It was it was blatant. Yeah, it, yeah. It was, it was direct. Even even a coach there, the Gucci. Yeah. Coach, if you go back, he stands up and he. You know, it it was it yeah, was yeah. blatant. I think maybe she. I don't know. Maybe she was frustrated. You know, maybe the stress of the situation. That's I don't it. know. Yeah. But 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 you know you we would have thought you know she's a double world champion. You know, Beloaded. Very experienced, although young, but very experienced. You would have thought she would never make a mistake like that. But maybe the stress of the competition, the spur of the moment, it just happened, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a walking katami. You could see the Gucci was hurt. She was injured actually, right. by at least in pain, you know. So yeah, so that 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 brought the Gucci up into the into the final. So now let's look at Klim K. Uh, first one against Ballhouse of Germany, right? It's a very low cross grip uh Sionagi, not a big throw, actually, but enough for our Wazari. Okay, so it's a Sionagi, typical clip cake technique. And then um then she was against Eleva of Bulgaria. And she won that by Hansuku Make when her opponent got three Shidos, right? Um against Yudis of Turkey, th this was quite interesting. The her opponent injured herself trying to do a sumi gaishi somehow her support leg got trapped on the you know on the mat and and fell he she fell the wrong way and i don't know if she broke her foot but she was clearly in pain and couldn't go on mm. so sorry so it's not it's not hansuku maki so so that one was not a hansuku maki but a kikin gachi where she had to withdraw okay so clean peak won against bulgaria with hansuku maki after three shidos and then she won with Yudes, where the player had to forfeit the match. Okay, so in both cases, she didn't have to throw anybody. She, she won the match without throwing anybody. 
And then that brought her against uh, Olympic and world champion Silva. Rafaela Silva from Brazil, who's making a comeback herself and then mm-hmm. still in, in top form. Still in top form. Uh, but I, I told you before, Clean Kate can play the tactical game. He knows how to play the tactical game. And 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 uh Silva lost by Hansuko Maki after getting three shidos. Mm. So so Klinke is very good with tactics, right? You you she she can play tactics and force you to get shidos and all that. And and so she won by Hansuko Maki. So that is yet another match that she won without having to throw her opponent. And then then that brought her uh into the final against Deguchi. And no, you but- can see. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I, I want to, if you don't mind, I, in terms of attacking the support leg there with, with Stark, you know, yeah. have people actually gotten injured at, at tournaments, at major tournaments, d- due to someone uh, attacking the support leg? Have have you have you seen any of that happen? I have not actually seen it. You know, the the times when uh, it doesn't happen often, but the times when when it does happen, and 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 a hansukumaki is given. The opponent usually is, is not in a, not really even in pain. Sometimes they're rubbing their legs and you don't know whether that's play acting or you know uh or, or, or you know, but uh to emphasize the fact that it's a you know it's an illegal technique, whether they're just highlighting it to the referee or whether they are really in pain. But I've not seen anybody like break a leg because of it, you know. But the potential for it is there if you if you look at it, if if you insert your leg from behind in between and to attack the supporting leg. Right. You could very easily imagine if both of them fell to the ground and and the opponent's uh, leg is straightened, that the, the knee could be bent the wrong way. It could be hyperextended and bent the wrong way. You could see how it could be a dangerous technique. But, but to answer your question, I've not actually seen an injury as a result of that. I've seen an injury as a result of walking Gatami, though. I've seen many injuries where... Arms got broken, you know, because of walking katami. So walking katami definitely is is a very dangerous thing. Do you think uh, the, the Gucci was injured going into the, the, the match here? Because you know, oh, it didn't look like it. It, it didn't, didn't look, look like it. it. Okay. Yeah, it didn't look like it. I mean, she lost because Klimkit managed to control her power hand and was fighting tactically, and then you know, in a moment of, I guess, distraction during the. Golden score. She 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 managed to drop underneath the Gucci and throw her with a, a drop sole, which she never was able to do before. She 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 had never you know as good as her drops in Nagi and drop sole were are as good as 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 those throws are. She she was never able to catch the Gucci with that until now, and then she did it this time. But she she was fighting a very very tactical match. In in terms of the takeaway for you, the, this Kunkai the, the Gucci, Klinkate the Gucci saga, what what are as fans, what can we expect from these two moving forward? Because obviously, you know, there's the world championships the down the road. Next year we've got the Olympics. So this is a very, I would imagine, critical time for, for all these competitors, not just these two. But what's your takeaway overall from 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 this tournament. In terms of in terms of them versus the rest of the world or in terms of them against each other? Well, l- let's explore both. Okay. Well, see, the thing is that, like I said, both of them have proven that they are world beaters, right? They can beat the best in the world. Both of them are world champions, mm. right? So obviously, they, they can beat the best in the world. So you can expect, what you can expect is that the Gucci and Tim Kate are going to be at the top of the medal uh, uh, of the IGF rankings for you know uh the coming coming year leading into the Olympics. You can see, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they're you know either taking the number one or the number two spot. You know, it could be the Gucci at number one and Clean Kate at number two, or Clean Kate at number one and the Gucci at number two. Certainly, the top three spots, you know, would would be would would, would feature these these two. Uh, if not the top two sort spots, and and I think you will see that going forward, uh, neck to neck, just like before, you know, leading into the Tokyo Olympics. So the interesting question is, how will Canada decide who to uh to choose? Because 
I think it's almost certain both will qualify. It's almost certain both will qualify. Right. So you have two qualified, you know, for, for the Olympics. How do you choose? Right. And, and are you going to have a special playoff? Best of three? Or are you just going to rely on the results of the world championships? I don't know. So that'll be interesting. It sure will be. And, and we're looking forward uh, to, to following along and, and seeing how things uh, unravel. But uh, we're going to move on to the next chapter here. I guess we're going to be exploring y- your favorite competitor, Teddy Renair. <laughs> yeah, is, is, Teddy is, Renair. Is he your favorite? No, 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 no. I mean, he's a heavyweight. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I was a lightweight player. I tend to look at lightweight players more so than heavyweights. But, but, uh, but you know, he's certainly one of the great champions, the great heroes of, 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 of you know, modern judo. It's just that, you know, uh, yeah, like I said, he's a heavyweight. I was a lightweight player. So I tend to look at, at lighter weight players. But of course, you know, uh, you, you have to follow Teddy Renair's uh, career as well. If you're into judo, you you know, you can't avoid uh, uh, Teddy Renair. He's a bigger than life uh, personality in the world of judo. The biggest star in world judo, really. Absolutely. Yeah. And he competed, of course, at the Paddy Grand Slam 2023. Uh, let's talk about his performance. He obviously won uh, the gold. What did you think of his performance and what were the main takeaways for you? Okay. Well, you know, uh, in, in previous, in recent years, in recent years, and certainly leading up to the Tokyo Olympics, uh, if you look at his, the few times he competed, and he didn't compete a lot. I mean, he, he competed very little. and But in a few times when he did compete, he looked sluggish, you know. I mean, I think everybody would say that. He looked slower than usual. His techniques were not very sharp. And um, and, and and a lot of his big techniques didn't seem to be working. Right? His Uchimata wasn't really working. His Osotogari wasn't really working. He still had his Sumi Gaishi, but, you know, he, he seemed sluggish and really, you know, not his usual self, which is probably why he, he, he didn't win in the, in the Tokyo Olympics. You know, it's not surprising that, that that he didn't win the gold there because he wasn't at his best. Okay, mm-hmm. since then uh, he's been training a lot. You see him at training camps. You know, pictures and videos of him at training camps around the world in Japan and so on. So he's been training, but he still hasn't been competing a whole lot. He he, he just doesn't compete a whole lot. And uh, you know, we can have a whole conversation about whether that's the right strategy or not. But it certainly was proven to be the wrong strategy for the Tokyo Olympics. Because if it was the right strategy, he would be the gold medalist, right? And the fact that, that, that he failed to get a goal there shows that that was the wrong strategy. And, you know, after that, I would have thought he might have readjusted and changed his strategy, but it seems like he's still going by that same strategy, not competing a whole lot, you know? Mm. Competing very little. I, I, I don't know why, but... Um, but you know, in, in Paris, uh, his first three matches he threw his opponents, right? He was able to get his Uchimata going again. And so so uh it, you know he 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 was able to throw again, which was something he, he didn't do a whole lot, you know, in the in previous years leading up to Tokyo. But but he looked sharper, uh, he was able to to launch his opponents with, with big throws. But I think what's important to note is that. In his semi-final, uh, he couldn't throw his opponent. He won by Shido. He won by penalties. And yeah. in the final, well, I, again... I it was Becky, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Yusupov is his name. And then in the final against the Japanese, uh, Ota, I think it was his name. Uh, not a very well-known Japanese uh, heavyweight, but uh, but... He, he, he relied on Shido play, pulling his head down. You know, Rene relied on Shido play, pulling his opponent's head down and causing him to get penalties. And of course, that's a legal way, a legitimate way to win. But he's going back to his, you know, to his old tricks, which is to pull people's head down. And, you know, whenever he fights a really tough opponent, like Mikhail Lin, you know, of, of Russia for, for in the Olympics, in the 2012 Olympics and... And, and whenever he fights a strong Japanese, he tends to rely on, on Shido play and, and pulling their opponent's head down and causing them to get Shido, mm. you know? And, and 
I've always, one thing that I've always questioned is that, you know, there's an IGF rule that if you pull your opponent's head down and you don't do anything, you're not actually attacking from there, you should get a Shido. But he rarely gets Shido for that, you know? I mean, when he pulls his opponent's head down and doesn't attack, for some reason, the opponent gets the Shido. I mean, if you were to read the, the rule book of the IGF, it says that if you just pull the head down and you don't attack, you can get a Shido, right? For, for not attacking, just pulling the opponent's head down. And he does that quite a lot and never gets penalized for it. So I don't know if it's bias or I don't know what you want to call it, but mm. I think that's pretty unfair. And uh, against Ota, it did happen a few times. He pulled the guy's head down. Okay, you know, that maybe it's true the guy was was bent over, but Rene wasn't really attacking when he pulled the head down. Mm. There was no serious effort to attack. Just pulling the head down, trying to get a Shido. But they, they let him get away with it. And he often gets away with it. Well, let's, uh, very interesting points. Let's go back to his match against the uh, Aziri, whom I can't pronounce his name. I believe it's Gamzat Kanov from uh, Azerbaijan. This is in the quarterfinals. Uh, do you recall this match? I, I, think it was, I think it was Osoto, right? The Aziri was on, on his knees and then. Right, he, he, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that was a pretty good throw. Yeah, that was good. So you know, re- but the, these these players, his his first three fighters, were, were not the very top players in in in, in the heavyweight division, right? Yeah. I want to see him fight to Shishvili, for example. Right. I would have liked to see him fight Kapalak, but Kapalak has gone back down to minus one hundred. I like to see him fight Kageura, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I I, I want to see who has beaten him before. Right. In the, in the kind of stuff. So I want to see you fight the really the very top players, not you know, and we haven't had the chance to see that yet because he doesn't compete that much. Right. Who uh, you know, right now have he, difficulty sorry, fighting? Young yeah, people have difficulty. I mean, somebody like Tushish Vili, if he wants to fight Rene, it's quite difficult because Rene doesn't fight that much. Right. You know, they they, they fought in a, a team club, European Club Cup championships recently. Do you know about that? To no, I do not. No. Yeah, it was a team championship they fought. And that was an interesting competition because and you can you can see clips of it online on YouTube and all that. In that competition, Tushishi really was declared the winner. And you'll find this interesting because it relates to something we were talking to earlier. Tushishi really was declared the winner because he seemingly scored against Rene. But if you watch the slow motion replay, he did that move where you attack the supporting leg from behind and inside. He did that exact move that we described that, you know, which 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 is deemed dangerous. Right. Uh, and, and, and what's interesting is this. This is actually in the context of judo is interesting. He did that, yet he was not penalized and was given a score. And he was awarded the match. They actually bowed out and they left and uh, there was a lot of controversy. There was a lot of outcry because clips were, went online and people said, he clearly did an, uh, a Hansukumaki infringement. Why didn't he get a Hansukumaki, right? Rene should have won that one. And there was an outcry and the outcry was so huge that the IJF intervened and reversed the results of that match and declared Rene the winner. And that, to my knowledge, that has never been done before. Once the players leave the mat, even if it's a wrong call, it's a wrong call. Once you leave the mat, it's over. You can't change the, the results. So I think for the first time ever, the IGF said, went back and said, no, that, that call was the wrong call. No. Tushish really shouldn't have gotten the Wazari. Tushish really should have gotten the Hansukumaki. And Rene should have been the winner. Even though at that competition, Tushish really was declared the winner. So the IGF went back and reversed a decision. Wow, that's quite interesting. Huh? I, I yeah, totally. And and I you know I I follow a variety of different uh, social media accounts when it comes to 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 judo, but I I don't recall seeing this. So I'm, you're gonna have to send me that information. I'm curious. Okay, I'll, I'll send you a link to it. Yeah, yeah but, no, but this is, this is yeah. Really... So he did that. He did that 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 exact move we talked about, where you right. attack the supporting thing. He did that. <laughs> 
What are your um, What are your thoughts on uh, Saito? I, I think I had asked you that before, and and you were I think at the time you you didn't you know you, you didn't think he he uh, well I'll ask you again I won't uh, paraphrase right. what you said. Well, well, at what the time you when you asked me, yeah, he 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 was so new. Right. He was so new and, and and still unknown, and I can't remember whether it was before the World Championships or it was after when when you asked me that question, but. He has since made it to the final of the World Championships where he lost to the to the Cuban. Right. Yeah. And of course, the Cuban much smaller than he, he is. And Cuban uh, was not able to throw him, but the Cuban did Shido play and did a lot of attacks. He got three Shidos and and and, and so the, the Cuban won through tactical play. Mm. So what that what that tells me is that at least up to that point, uh Saito was not so tactically aware. I'm sure after he lost the final to the Cuban because of Shido, he and his coach would have sat down and watched that match over and over again and they would have figured out, right, this is what you need to do next time. You can't afford to fight like that anymore, you know, against a tactical player. So I think he's probably since become more tactically aware. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in a matchup against Rene, it would be very interesting because he's a physically big guy. Uh, he's he's probably not as tall as Vinay, but he's heavier. He's big, right? He's like his father, uh, the great uh, Saito uh, senior, who, who was a double Olympic champion, huh? world champion, a double Olympic champion. So Saito Junior is is probably bigger than the father. You know, he's huge. He's a big guy, and I think it would be quite hard for Vinay to throw him with an Uchimata or also. I think. Maybe a Sumigaiji might work, but it won't be so easy for Rene to throw him. So Rene might go back to his uh, old standby, you know, his uh, old faithful, which is Shido play. <laughs> and 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 that has proven to work against Saito before, right? Mm-hmm. The Canadian uh, the, the Cuban managed to do it. And right. win, uh, so but 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 I would I would say that definitely his coach would have uh, you know sort of briefed him on how to fight. Tactical players, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, every, I think everybody wants to see a fight between Rene and, and, and Saito. Could you imagine at 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 the Olympics, Paris twenty twenty four, them two in the finals? That would be epic. That would be, that would be fantastic. Epic, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I mean, either Saito and 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 Rene or or Tushishvili and Rene will be very interesting. Big time. Yeah. Do you think Renier will stay on past the, the Olympics? Uh, he's 34 years old. I would old. say most certainly not. I mean, you know, he's really, uh, I think he's, I, I don't know what's his age, but certainly around 30. 34, you know? I, th- I believe. Is he 34? I he's already 34? Yeah. Right. So, you know, uh, I don't think he will stay beyond that, you know. Uh, certainly if he wins his third individual Olympic medal, uh, he, he he will retire. Most certainly, but even if he doesn't, I think this is his, this is his final bid for the Olympics. I don't think he will want to go on. I mean, you know, he's getting injuries, getting older. You're right; he's 33 years old, coming to 34 soon, in April. Right. So, I mean, you know, he'll be 35 by <laughs> next year. So, I think this is it. I think this is it. he could go on, but I don't think that there's any reason for him to do so after, you know, after this. I think this is it. I can't believe I, I missed the story on Tatishvili uh, and, and Rainier, uh in, in the club tournament thing that you're talking. This is to, to me, it's like what I, I didn't. How come I didn't hear? And the fact that the IGF got involved and, and reversed this, this the decision. Pardon me. I yeah, that, I that, that's quite it. groundbreaking. That's quite groundbreaking because, as I told you, once the players leave the mat, that's usually it. Even if there's a wrong call, that's usually it. You know, you don't. Right. Change the call, even if it was off. But it was so egregious because it was all over social media, and and you know the Georgians were posting it, and they were celebrating the win. But then you can clearly see he did that illegal move. Right. Uh, he clearly did that illegal. In fact, on on my judo crazy Facebook page, I think I I I had posted it. So if you scroll oh, down, what what, yeah, what yeah, month yeah. was this? What month was this? It's like. Me, I can't. Me, two months ago, one month ago, something like that. Wow. It wasn't that. Old. And and so, uh, yeah. And and I I posted a clip that showed the move, the illegal move done from two or three different angles. And 
uh, yeah, so it was it was pretty interesting in that sense. Mm. But maybe if it, it fell under your radar because it uh beneath your radar because um uh because uh it was not an IGF event per se. It right. wasn't like a Grand Slam or, or, or Grand Prix, it was a European Club Cup. So right. like a we we don't get much of that sort of club coverage here. Uh, I I don't see much of that. Yeah, coverage. there is a, there's coverage in Europe, but yeah, no, no, there's not a whole lot, and you can't watch it on. It's not on YouTube or anything, you know. Well, how come? Well, why don't they brought? But by the way, I'm probably going to remove this portion of of our of our. Okay. Interview. I, I unless okay. you want me to keep it, uh, it's up to you. Yeah, you could. If you think it's interesting, you can spice it in. Okay. But yeah, no, because it's it's uh it's 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 not an IGF event, so the IGF doesn't doesn't have cameras there, you know. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, I mean, uh, it, again, this is all uh, surprising and uh, rather a little odd there that they came in and interviewed. But we're going to move on now to our next chapter, our final chapter here. We're going to be speaking about Agbegbunu. Uh, let's talk about her return to competition and her performance. At, uh, yeah. Tel Aviv well, do, do you are you aware of the of the controversy that she was embroiled in? It, did you read about that? You know where I read it on on Judo <laughs> Crazy <laughs> after I okay. joined as a patron. I had no clue. I I you know I right. I just joined and I've been. So now you know what you know you know what happened, right? So well, actually, uh, do, you, do you mind putting that in context? Do, okay. do you mind sharing and, and telling us? Uh, it's up to you, of course. I I had no clue. I was. I had right, right. Any mention so, of that so so she's making this comeback right uh after having a baby and she's making this comeback uh her grand comeback interesting that her comeback was not at the Paris Grand Slam but in the Tel Aviv Grand Slam and you know uh it's always difficult making a comeback uh after you've been away for a while and usually your first comeback bit you won't do so well so it it is not unusual that she didn't do so well that in itself is not so unusual, but one can't help but wonder, you know, how much she was affected by the controversies that um, surrounded her, uh, her, her, her comeback. Because, well, in a nutshell, what it is is that she wanted to wear her own uh, personal judogi, which was the Mizuno judogi. She's sponsored by Mizuno, right? So she wanted to wear Mizuno, but the French team's official uh, judogi is, is, is by Adidas. Which is a supplier for the for the French team, and so she wanted to have the right to wear her own judogi, and the the French judo federation said no, you cannot, and uh, because she insisted on on wearing her own judogi, they they deprived her of funding, among other things, but also no mat side coach. For they didn't allow any coaches to to coach her during the competition, so she fought without a, a mat side coach. And we'll never know how much that affected her, you know. Some players maybe are very independent and, and don't have to rely so much on their coach. But some players, you know, they need that support, the presence of their coach to, to make them uh, perform at their very best. Some, so I don't know what type of player she is, whether that affected her uh, so much. But also the fact that she has this this controversy surrounding her must have affected her mindset. Again, well, we don't know how much it affected her, but she lost to players that, you know, she would not normally lose to, you know? And, um, and so uh, we'll have to see, you know, in coming competitions, how, how she does. But here she didn't perform so well, you know, she didn't perform so well. Right. In, in terms of that, uh, how it affected her, I would imagine not, not having a coach there after being away for for so long, obviously, you know, becoming a mother, she, she's got a little and, bit of all those changes. This, yeah, and having this spat with the Federation, it, it surely must affect your I, mindset. I, I, absolutely, right? I mean, it, and it's it rather unfortunate and, and ironic because this is her comeback, right? Her her return yeah. to competition. Very unfortunate. Yeah, very unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. But you mean... know, but when whenever a player uh uh goes away for a while and makes a comeback, it's it's difficult. It, it, we've seen uh many situations in the past where players didn't succeed. Okay, so if you want example examples, uh, uh 
uh, Kim Jae Boom from uh, South Korea, Wang Ki Chun from South Korea. They both attempted to make a comeback for the uh, Olympics and and uh, couldn't make it. They did. They, they weren't successful in making a comeback. Uh, Kayla Harrison uh, managed to do it. Kayla Harrison, but you know when she first came back, uh, uh, I remember she she fought in uh, a world championships. I I believe it was the one in, if I'm not mistaken, the one in Astana, Kazakhstan, where she lost to a to a relatively unknown Korean, you know, and she just she she just lost. And it it took a while for her to get back, you know, uh, her stride, you know, and 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 then of course she eventually became a, a double Olympic champion. But but uh, when she first came back, she she didn't do so well either. So you know, looking at Abeg Ninu, I think it's too early to say that that her comeback won't be successful. I mean, we we talked about the Gucci earlier when she first came back after three years away. She in her first two Grand Slams, she lost in the first round. Right. Just lost in the first round, you know. And so, so when you first come back, it is quite normal to have some difficulty. And maybe that's that's all that it was. But you know, uh one can't help but wonder what will happen going forward with this if she insists on wearing her, her Mizuno Junogi and 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 the Federation continues to ban her coach. From being mad side, you know what's going to happen. You know, I mean, is she always going to fight without a coach? I think this needs to be resolved. Agreed. Really yeah. to... and, and there was an article that uh, that was published on the IGF website titled "Clarice with this crowd, I was not alone." I, I don't know if you if you read it, but I in in the... one, yeah. pardon me, I didn't read it. I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, well, she goes on a bit. Basically, they interview her and she talks about. Uh, I can read a quote here if you'd like. Okay. Well, yeah. She goes on. She says, I feel like a competitor, of course. And so I felt I should have won. I needed to be stronger and faster, but I knew that being in perfect shape couldn't be my whole priority. I just needed to come back. And this experience tells me what my next focus is. And she goes on to talk about coming back uh, or, you know, the new rules, of course, making weight and, and getting her quote unquote rhythm back and her full uh, judo strength. And overall, the, the fans uh, obviously are are huge fans of, uh, of of her. They were fully supporting her there. You could hear the the crowd were there was the incredible. They're they're always hyped over there in, in Tel Aviv. It's it's awesome. But uh, do you think she'll be ready for for the Olympics? Do you think she'll she'll make it there? Well, there's certainly enough time, and you know, uh, and and if she's like. Uh, uh, if she's anything like Kayla Harrison or or Krista De Gucci, well, she can certainly make a comeback after initially faltering. I mean, there's still enough time, and we just have to see in the coming months, you know, the coming competitions, how 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 well she performs. But I think this controversy with the federation, it, 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 it re she really needs to get that sorted out because uh, I guess she didn't address this. Controversy in that article, right? She did, but I, I, you know, it's it's funny. It's sorry to interrupt. I didn't see anything. I, you, you're like the only source that that speaks about this. Well, not oh, you know, inside ran, ran a, a story. Oh, about okay. it. my friend Hans Van Essen, okay. yeah, ran the story, and of course, he's in the French press. Okay, but I guess it's the kind of stuff that IGF won't won't publish. They 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 don't want to highlight controversies, but. But yeah, it's yeah. a real serious issue, right? It's, it's affecting her funding, and it's affecting her her her, her coach, right? Uh, uh, her her ability to have a mad side coach. So it's obvious. It's obviously a problem, it, and it, it needs to be resolved. You know, it can't it can't remain this way. Yeah, you know? she can't compete this way. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I, I, I think she, go ahead. She's such a dominant fighter. I think she could make a comeback, but she needs to resolve this problem. For sure, and I guess we'll we'll see what happens moving forward with that. We, you know, she she's won five worlds, and she she's uh, an Olympic medalist, which is an incredible thing to have on your resume. I mean, even if if she bowed out and said peace out, folks, I'm yeah. done. She she's still a legend, but you know, uh, absolutely. But I guess we'll see what happens. So you published uh, some articles on uh, on your 
not on Judo Crazy, the, the website or the Patreon. My, 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 my Judo Club website, yeah. That's right. And uh, the first one is called Practical Training for an Absolute Beginner. I want to know yeah. wh what what inspired this article because I you shared it with me. You shared this one and also another one called Advanced Training for Senior Players. It's an article, uh, but both articles come with a video where you kind of, I guess you, you yeah, know. we can see what's what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first one, practical training for beginners, right? So you know, judo is a sport that is steeped in tradition. It's steeped in tradition, and there's a certain very classical, traditional way of 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 uh, teaching beginners, right? You spend a lot of time on ukemi. You spend a lot of time teaching them the so-called basics, and you know, in some extreme cases, I mean, I've heard that in Japan. Uh, where you know school children go to to judo, right? They'll spend. There are cases. I mean, I'm not sure how far this is true, but people have told me, you know, the first six months just doing ukemi, just doing breakfalls, which is boring as hell, right? It's not surprising that people drop out of judo. Right? You do six months of ukemi, and 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 I, I tell you, I've got to tell you this story. One, because it affects my thinking about training as well. We in my club, we 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 have international visitors, and once we had a a guy, I can't remember exactly where he's from, but I, I, I think it was Denmark. Okay. I think it was Denmark. He came to Kuala Lumpur. He trained at our club. And if I'm not mistaken, he was an orange belt or a, a green belt. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't a white belt and he wasn't a yellow belt. I, it probably an orange belt, but could have been a green belt. And, and he came and he trained and he knew his stuff. I mean, he obviously knew techniques and, and so on. And so we did some randori. Right, and we, and we do a lot of randori in my club, and so we did some randori, some sparring with it. And, and after the the session was over, I asked him, "So how how do you like the training?" He said, "It's really fun, you know. It's my first time doing randori." I said, "Your first time doing randori? How can that be?" Oh, wow! And, and, and he said, "My coach won't allow me. He thinks I'm still too junior." So you know, you have this guy who's a, a, an orange belt, or, or or maybe possibly even a green belt. He's never done randori. But okay, let's say he's an orange belt. Let's say he's not a green belt. An orange belt never doing randori, that's crazy. You know, and, and so to me, he must have come from a very, very super conservative, classical, traditional club that, you know, you do tons of, of ukemi and you're not allowed to randori until you reach a certain level and all that. So, you know, like I said, judo is a, is a club, uh, is, a, is a sport steeped in tradition. Uh, and and sometimes to the detriment of the sport. I mean, you, and 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 to me, I approach judo uh, as a sport. I don't even approach it as a martial art. I know it's considered a martial art, and in some ways, it is. I guess you could argue it's a martial art, but I view it as a sport. It's much like wrestling, you know. Right. Uh, it's a combat sport, but it's a sport, and mm -hmm. my approach is that of a sport. And you know, and I'll teach what's practical. Okay, I I I, I won't uh, I won't be bogged down by tradition. Right. I'm not against tradition. I'm not against classical techniques. I'm not against any of these things. But I won't be bogged down by it. And you know, one of the things that um, that that uh, every experienced judo player and judo coach will tell you is that um, when it comes to to techniques. Sometimes the classical way really is inefficient or doesn't work, you know, mm. right? Like a, a class, I mean, uh, actually, do you do judo yourself? Do you, do you, do you play I, judo? I haven't done it in years. I'm, uh, <laughs> I've, I've had some injuries actually over the last uh, year or so. And the irony is I was hoping to get back into the, on, on the mats. But right. uh, I, I think it's, I'm at that point where it's, if you throw me, I don't know if I'll be able to get up, to be honest. I mean, right. it's, it's... So, but are you familiar with Ipon Sionagi? Do you know what oh, Ipon yes, Sionagi yes. Of course. Right. Okay. Yes, yeah. So Ipon Sionagi is a good example. To, uh, traditionally, it's taught that you throw off the sleeve side. You don't throw off the lapel side. You mm -hmm. throw off the sleeve. That, that's the tradition. All the textbooks will show that. All the Kodokan videos will show that. All the classical teachers will teach that. And you go to most clubs around the world, they'll teach you throw off the sleeve, throw off the sleeve, right? But you see all these top 
international competitors, they throw off the lapel. Hmm. Even the Japanese, uh, very few of them throw off the sleeve. Ipon Sionagi, I'm talking about Ipon Sionagi. Koga throws, the great Koga, the greatest Ipon Sionagi pl uh, player of all time. He throws off the lapel. Ebinuma throws off the lapel. When Nomura does Ipon Sionagi, he's mainly a Morote Sionagi player, but when he does Ipon Sionagi, he throws off the lapel. So most say Oenagi players throw off, Ipon Sionagi players throw off the lapel. They don't throw off the sleeve. But it's, but it's not taught that way. It's taught that you should throw off the sleeve. So players who develop Ipon Sionagi as their Tokuiwaza uh, figure this out by themselves. They figure out maybe by watching videos or through trial and error or watching other players in live situation throw off the lapel and they pick it up. But that's not how they're taught. They're mm. taught throw off the sleeve. So for me, practical judo means I tell my players straight away, throw off the lapel. Forget about the sleeve. Doesn't work. It's not good. It's not, it, it, not to say that it can't work, but it's not as effective as throwing off the lapel. I mean, we can get into a whole technical discussion on why it's better to throw off the lapel, but suffice to say for now that that, that throwing off the lapel is more efficient, more effective for Ipon Tsunagi. So for practical judo, I'll just say, I won't even, uh, I, I might mention to the player, okay, traditionally you'll be taught to throw off the sleeve, but don't waste time on that. Let's just throw off the lapel. You know, so that's an example of practical judo. I don't care about the traditional way in which it's taught. I'll teach you the way that works. You know, it's fascinating uh, reading the article and, and seeing the video and, and just hearing what you're saying here now, because, and I know, I know you don't care for, for other, other combat sports, so I'm not trying to annoy you with, with, with this. You're, you're strictly judo, judo crazy. I, I get that. I respect that. But in other combat sports, grappling based ones, everything is about, pra well, I'll, I'll say one, one in particular, everything is about practicality. In fact, I agree. You know, I agree. Like from day one, and it doesn't matter which dojo you're at. Like in terms of you know the application of uh, of randori, of course, some of these. I'm speaking uh, Niwaza Bay sports, uh, grappling styles. It's all practicality, and you know the, yeah, the drilling. Absolutely. And and in, I in mean, any sport actually, in 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 any sport. I mean, I had a conversation with one of my 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 players. Who, who, who's really into this practical judo as well. And he said, judo is probably the only Olympic sport where, you know, there are practices which are actually detrimental to the development of the player because they're actually teaching them classical things that don't work. You know, <laughs> and, 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 and you won't find that in wrestling. You won't find that in boxing. You won't find that in any sport, rugby. You won't find that in football. You won't find that in tennis. You, won't, you know, in every other sport, combat or otherwise, practical techniques are taught, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a sport. So you follow sports science and you do what works, right? Judo is the, because it's steeped in tradition right. and there's a traditional way of, of, of doing it, people tend to do the traditional, tend to teach the traditional way, which is not how it is done in competition. You know, it's it's funny too because, uh, and I appreciate what you're, you're seeing here. I'll give you another example. Even in, you know, I the first style I I trained in was actually sambo, but it was mm -hmm. kurtka based and also gi based, like no, no gi based sambo. And one of the okay. first throws I was taught was actually sumi gaeshi, but off of a two on one entry. Yes, no gi, and then with a a, a, a gi on. A, be a judo right. key or a kurt key, it doesn't matter, you know. So, yeah. so that practicality of of just even transitioning from, you know, well, what's your grip strategy when there is nothing yeah. to grip, you know? If you've got, well, the, you know what I'm saying in terms of you can still gra grab the wrist, you can grab the, the neck, and and you can work yeah. on so on. I mean, that as a beginner, that's like one of the first throws. Uh, I, I was taught, and till this day, I still do the damn, the same damn thing. Why? Because it's practical and it works, and it's yeah, it, it's nothing special, but it still works. And I think the the lesson of like, as you're in this article for for folks who want to read it, you can check it out on 
uh, KLG.com. KLG. 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 And, you know, you're talking about everything about, you know, uh, from, I think the first one you have is the Neil Adams, Yuji Gatami role. You, hmm. Number two, you've got the Ipan Sisyonagi. Then you've got number three, the stomach wrap or, or the gut wrench. Then the drop, Sisyonagi. And then the, the pine roll. And also, pine wood roll. Six, sorry? Pine, pine wood. wood roll. Pardon me, yeah. yes. The pine wood. Number six, what was surprising, uh, but very interesting that, and you could see it in the video where, where you're putting your, your student through learning uh, the Nage, which which is, <laughs> you know, which is very, very bold in a way for, for the student. And you can watch the student. She, she's going through the motions and she, she's doing quite well, I would imagine, for, for a beginner. What yeah. uh, you know? How how common is this practical judo? Uh, this focus on practical judo? Because I'm sure some people might be hearing this um, and saying, "Well, what do you mean? It, You're deep. It's not common. It's not common in the world of judo, right? Most judo clubs approach judo and teach judo in a very traditional, classical way. Most, and and the only places that I've been through that you know adopt a very practical approach are those very sports-oriented judo clubs, right. you know, and I've trained that uh, uh, in Europe and in America in sports-oriented clubs, and uh, they are more modern, you know, and they, they 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 tend to focus on practical techniques because their purpose is to, to train players to win, right? But, but most judo clubs around the world are very traditional, steeped in tradition, and, um, and, and, and they will teach the classical way, which, uh, you know, which often doesn't work. I mean, sometimes it works. And I think I should say that, you know, I'm not against traditional techniques. I'm not against classical techniques as long as they work. If if, if a, a traditional version of a technique like a kojigari, traditional kojigari, you, uh, are you familiar with kojigari? Is it yeah. inside leg sweeper? So kojigari, tradi the traditional way actually works and it's, it's, it's how I teach it as well. So if it works, I'll teach it. But if it doesn't work and it's in the, the traditional way is ineffective or inefficient, then, then I won't teach it. So I'm not against uh, anything classical or traditional as long as it works, as long as it works. But yeah, to answer your question, it, it, this is not the case in most judo clubs. It is not common. Most judo clubs are very traditional. Right, and I guess uh, there's we can spend like possibly another hour on on this topic, <laughs> but you know I and I think I, I recommend people check out both articles as I mentioned on kljudo.com. There's another uh, blog post, pardon me. There's another blog post here called "Advanced Training for Senior Players," and th this one's really dynamic and and very interesting because of course it's uh, it's practical, but it's also for competitors, right? Do you want to quickly yeah. give us a summary of this article? You you identify about eleven different uh, yes. drills. Yeah. Well, you know when when you're when you're um, training an uh, advanced player, preparing them for competition, uh, it's less about technique, right? It's less about developing their techniques. Usually, these players have their techniques already. They're not beginners, you know. So it's less about technical development. And it's more about uh, Im improving their gameplay, strategy, you know, uh, transitions, uh, you know, quick transitions from standing to groundwork, you know, ways to transition from standing to groundwork, right? Ways to open up your 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 partner uh, or your opponent on the ground, you know, uh, ways to to fight efficiently, strategically. Uh, and 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 that all all that involves a lot of drills. And by drills, I don't mean uchikomi. A lot of people think drills means uchikomi because in the world of judo, it's all all about uchikomi, uchikomi, uchikomi. But I don't believe in that. I, I I think drills are far more than that. And what what the drills I have them do uh, are things that simulate uh, real world or competition scenarios. So in, in a competition, they might face a, a, a scenario where, okay, they are in golden score. And yeah, you know what golden score is, right? It's the extra time. Yeah. A sudden that, uh, you know, if you if you get a, a, a wasari, you win. 
or, yeah. or if, if your opponent gets three Shidos, Hatsuko Maki, then you win, right? right? And so what do you do in Golden Score? How do you fight Golden Score? There's a different strategy, different mindset than when you're fighting in regular time. I mean, we, you know, in the future, if you want, we can go into depth about what you do, but, but suffice to say, the way you fight Golden Score is different than the way you fight in regular time. And, and so you have to put them in simulated situations where they are put under that kind of pressure. Mm. And, and so that they learn how to fight in Golden Score, where they learn how to, and, and so we have drills that mimic that, you know, and, so 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 I I think there's about ten or eleven drills there, right? Right. So these are drills that I I have them go through in a typical advanced training session preparing for competition. I mean tomorrow I'm going to be training these two same guys again. I'll do a different set of drills. So there uh, maybe I'll do another video and you mm. have a look at it. See if you find it equally fascinating. But these are all drills that you do to simulate situations that they would face in competition which, you know, they need to train for because in everyday randori and all that, they don't face that type of situation. You don't have golden score in randori, right? Mm. No, they don't normally face a golden score situation in everyday training. But in competition, they will face golden score. So you have to simulate that in training. You have to simulate the golden score environment so that they know how to fight in golden score. Right. You know, you if, if, if they never face that in, in, in everyday training, then they will be unprepared for it, right? Uh, and usually, you know, in everyday competition, I mean, in everyday training or even in randori, there's not a whole lot of transitions from standing to ground, right? I, usually I, there's not I, I was just going to flag, I was going to ask you about that because num number nine is transition drills yeah. and number 10 is uh, shoulder tap drill, which is... Uh, also awesome. transitions, right? Yeah. Right, so, right. So, they simulate a transition situation from Tachiwaza to Nemwaza, which they wouldn't normally face uh, that much in, in regular training. But in, in competition, you need to be able to have good transition. So you have to have drills, have them drill, drill that over and over again so that they get used to it. So basically, that's what it is. And, and so advanced training for, for these uh, senior players preparing for competition is very different from... Uh, uh, a training that you do for a beginner. When you're training a beginner, you're teaching technique. Mm. You're teaching them technique, how to do a Tomoe Nage, how to do a Harazutsumi, how to do an Ipon Nage, right? I just want to do, I just want to do your Nagis all day, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but for senior players, they already have the technique. You're not there to teach them technique. You're teaching them how to, how to win in a competition environment. Right. So it's very different. Yeah, very different how you teach an advanced player and how you teach a beginner. Right. Hey, so you're going to be putting more of these uh, articles up on the blog as well? Okay, cool. So I'll, I'm looking forward to to checking that out and uh, informing myself on 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 that. So uh, thank you very much for, for this interview here. And uh, we hope to do it again. Um, any last words? Anything else you want to share? Um, well, you know, I, I would say this. Uh, you know, I'll, one of the things that really excite me about judo and why I'm so much into like IJF and, and, and uh, you know, uh, competitions and stuff like that is that, you know, whenever I watch uh, a new competition, I'll spot something new. You know, it could be a new way to do a choke. It could be a new way to get, you know, a, a grip into a technique. It could be a new combination. It could be just a new variation or something, but it's, it's something new, something I've never seen before. Mm. Uh, I think I recently posted something about a new choke. You did, yeah, yes. I found yeah. very interesting. Yeah. So, so you know, somebody, one of my friends, actually, one of my judo acquaintances, just 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 a regular judo player, not not a high level judo player, but but a judo fan from Canada, actually, uh, messaged me and, and alerted me about this, and I saw it and I thought, wow, that's interesting, and and so you know, but you see this all the time, you know, in every Grand Prix and Grand Slam. When you watch the matches, you'll see something new. Mm. And so, you know, that tells me judo is a is 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 alive, is a sport that is still evolving and constantly evolving. It's not a static sport, it's not a you know, it, 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 you know, for, for many traditional judo coaches, uh judo is at a standstill from the 1970s. They they haven't, you know, to them, judo is what 
judo was, you know, how it was practiced in the 1960s or the 1970s. You know, they'll, they'll teach according to what was taught in the 1960s and 1970s. And, and that won't suffice. That won't do for modern judo. Judo has evolved. The rules have evolved. Gameplay has evolved. Athletes are more, you know, uh, athletic and they can do things that, that players couldn't do back then. And so everything has evolved. And you have to you have to change with the times. And if you watch IJF events, you'll see new things all the time, and it's fascinating. It, it's what keeps me interested in judo. And judo is very much a, a, a constantly evolving sport, and that that's why I love it. Hallelujah to that, man! And you know, it, it's great. It's great that you're you're documenting these these you know innovations or these variations and so on, and and sharing it. With us because there's just I mean a tournament there's so many hours so many matches in a tournament you know sometimes it's I'll be honest sometimes it's hard to watch a whole set of 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 matches you can you kind of get selective you know you I know I do I get selective you know obviously I I always want to watch the Canadians fight and I and I have my 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 other countries in terms of no not so much countries but styles that that I like to watch that, that I find entertaining or rivalries or what have you but no it's yeah. it's great that that you know you're you've been documenting a, a lot of this stuff and sharing this information because I think the judo ecosystem if we want to call it that uh I, I think the combat sports ecosystem needs that you know we need to be informed on on all of this B- beyond what the international federations put out of course so I think it's val- it's a win-win for all. So thank you very much for sharing uh, this conversation and, and providing your analysis and your insights on on all sorts of things here. I have uh, I have my uh, I have my homework now. I got I got to yeah. go. <laughs> okay, go on, go on. You know, go back and look for that Tushis really, really. Yeah, 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 man. I can't believe that. On the Judo Crazy Facebook page. Yes. There. Yes, I will check that out right now. I will check. Okay. It. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Have a good one.